Roger, you mentioned yesterday that you had five uh, doubts or obstacles when you went and uh, met Mr. Ramesh Balsekar. And uh, can you speak something about that? Yes. Um, so Ramesh was someone I met in a way by accident. Um, I was, I had been very affected in a positive way by the teachings of Nisargadatta Maharaj. And I had found something on the internet. I was searching something and came across the fact that Ramesh, who was a translator for Nisargadatta, was giving talks in Mumbai. And so I booked a flight on my way to Europe. I was on my way to Europe. I booked a stopover in Mumbai that gave me 36 hours to basically attend one satsang. And the only reason I was going was essentially to pay my respects to Nisargadatta. I wasn't familiar with Ramesh's teachings. Um, and my seeking had been happening for about three or four years at that stage. This was in 2005. And I guess you could say that a lot of the attachment to outcomes and belief in doership had dissolved because the teachings of Ramana Maharshi and Nisargadatta Maharaj and others had brought about a shift in perception, um, a recognition of the consciousness that is functioning through all of us. And resting in that ground meant that a lot of um, suffering was no longer happening because an involvement in what was happening in the flow of life wasn't, um, wasn't so present because life was being witnessed as an experience moment after moment after moment. So when I got to Ramesh, I wasn't really intending to find a teacher. Um, but I needed one because that process had sort of taken me to a place of witnessing life where I wasn't really acknowledging the human being as still being um, a significant aspect of life. And so Ramesh's teaching was exactly what was needed because he approached the, the topic from a practical daily living point of view. So the process that happened over about two years with Ramesh was a process of, I guess, nuances um, because the significant shift had sort of happened. But now I found myself with some spiritual beliefs that the earlier process had put in place. One of those beliefs was I am awareness or I am consciousness and I am not the body. And so on the first visit, um, which turned out to be more than one satsang because there were some floods in Mumbai and very serious floods and the airport was closed for eight days and just so happened that it started raining on the day I landed in Mumbai. So I, my one day turned into a 10 day visit. Um, and so we had some discussions and the first, in the first discussion, Ramesh had asked me, so who is speaking to whom? And I answered it like you could say consciousness is speaking with consciousness and consciousness is listening to consciousness. All there is is consciousness, which turns out to be one of Ramesh's key concepts. When I said that, Ramesh looked at me and said, Roger, don't be ridiculous. Roger is speaking to Ramesh and Ramesh is listening. Then Ramesh speaks to Roger and Roger listens. And I had felt like it had taken three or four years to see that there was no Roger and there, and there is no Ramesh. There is just consciousness appearing as Roger and Ramesh. And so his insistence that there is a Roger and there is a Ramesh and Roger is speaking to Ramesh was the first part of the process. That was the first um, 
big obstacle that I still had in place that needed to be addressed. The notion that I was awareness or consciousness, that all there was was awareness or consciousness, and not acknowledging that in practical terms, I am Roger and will always be Roger until the body dies. The um, other one was this notion that because all there is is awareness, that awareness is um, present in deep sleep. It's a teaching concept that's used and often we don't relate to these concepts as teaching concepts, we hear them as truth. So when a teacher says something, we often relate to it as if it's truth. And there's a good reason for um, a mention that of awareness and deep sleep. And so somewhere in the talk, Ramesh said, and in deep sleep, there is no awareness. And that wasn't at all in line with what I thought I knew, but actually turned out to be a belief. Because we can become aware of awareness in the waking state. And we can be aware in dreams. And there can be awareness in sleep. There can be um, a very subtle sense of existence, even in dreamless sleep. But in this particular teaching concept, the importance is placed on personal consciousness. Personal consciousness is the experience that is being had in the waking state. So everyone is having a personal consciousness experience right now. All of the visual content and the sound content and the smell, taste, touch, feelings, emotions, thoughts, it's all part and parcel of the personal consciousness experience. And in this teaching, it basically says, and in deep sleep, the personal consciousness experience is not there. It even goes as far as to say, even awareness is not there. And I was insisting, but there is awareness in deep sleep. I believed that I knew this, but in fact, I then came to see, I just believe this to be the case. Because if there is a state of deep sleep where consciousness or awareness is not even aware of itself, right, then we won't know that state. Because there won't be any awareness. So to insist that there is awareness all the time is actually just has to be a belief. And at some point, Ramesh said, if there is nothing to be aware of, where is the question of awareness? And it hit me. And I realized that I just had a belief about awareness in deep sleep. So when other teachers talk about awareness in deep sleep, to me they might be talking about awareness in a sleep state, where there is awareness of just awareness, just a sense of existence, very subtle sense of existence. In this teaching, the suggestion is, and the next phase beyond that is deep sleep, where awareness isn't even aware of itself. It's not really important to get into, but for me that was a, a significant realization that I believed something that was unconfirmable. And so to round off the framework with this notion that before the manifestation there's consciousness at rest, not even aware of itself, then consciousness at rest manifests and becomes aware of itself through the manifestation, through personal consciousness. And 
after the manifestation, consciousness will return to its resting form, ready to manifest again. But at that point, unaware of itself. God, not even aware of itself. And so a mirrored down version of that is that the waking state, the dream state, and the sleep state are essentially the manifestation, where consciousness is aware of itself through manifestation. And deep sleep is the absence of consciousness being aware of itself. <coughs> so that was the second um, thing that took a little bit of time for me to click with Ramesh. The third was where I had a oneness experience. Um, and I described that oneness experience in as best a way as I could. And in that oneness experience, there were a lot of the profound realizations that are spoken about, about oneness and being consciousness and not being the body. And Ramesh dismissed it as being just an experience. Don't worry about it, it's just an experience. And I couldn't understand what he was talking about because this was essentially um, all of the teachings presented in experiential form. And so there were quite a few months of me waiting for that experience to return, thinking that that was enlightenment. And in that process, it became clear that there was suffering arising in wanting it to return. And then it became clear what he meant. Roger, don't worry about it. That was just an experience or that was just circumstance. Um, what you're really looking for is peace of mind. And I was convinced that what this search was going to deliver was some very mystical shift where I was no longer the body, where everything was one. And when it hit home, when his point hit home, what you're looking for is peace of mind. You're not looking for a oneness experience. If you can have peace of mind without a oneness experience, would you take that? And I realized that I, my life before this very profound oneness experience was largely filled with peace. And then this oneness experience came and an expectation for it to return on a continuous basis kicked in and that was a disturbance of my peace. And then it became clear that I'm expecting something that's not necessarily available or at least something which is not what I'm really looking for. And as soon as it clicked, I'm just looking for peace of mind and daily living. Then the expectation for that oneness to return fell away. I said it's irrelevant. As soon as it was really deeply understood that it was irrelevant, it's just an experience, exactly what he said. Roger, don't worry about it, that was just an experience. As soon as it clicked, which took a, a couple of months of... So I clicked, I said, it's irrelevant, that was just an experience. What I'm looking for is peace of mind and I have it. Um, the fourth was this notion that he would put forward that says anger and sadness are biological reactions, they're not suffering. Enlightenment is not going to bring about the end of a biological reaction. Enlightenment will bring about the end of a resistance towards certain biological reactions and acceptance of them. And I couldn't reconcile this because whenever I felt anger arising and I felt in, I felt suffering present. So my experience was anger is a form of suffering, not a biological reaction. And his insistence was very clear. Roger, anger is a biological reaction and not suffering. And I kept saying, but when I feel it, it's suffering, not a biological reaction. As I was very familiar with what suffering felt like. And once again, it took a 
couple of months of wrestling with this in my head. And then it occurred to me that I have an expectation that enlightenment will bring about the end of, of anger. And with that expectation, every time anger arose, there was suffering around the anger that happened so simultaneous to the anger that <clears throat> I couldn't tell the difference. So what I was feeling was actually the anger surrounded by a layer of suffering from my expectation that, that anger would no longer arise. And as soon as that clicked, and I realized that the suffering that I'm feeling is not the anger, but my relationship to the anger. And I thought, what if anger is just a biological reaction that is allowed to arise and doesn't actually disturb peace of mind? I, I, I really thought, wow, what if that's the truth? And a couple of weeks later, because it, it, when, it, when it occurred to me, it really occurred to me with some clarity about what was actually happening, that I had an expectation that anger was part of unenlightenment. And because I was seeking this enlightenment, I had an expectation that anger would no longer arise. And then in this moment, it was clarity. It's like, what if what he's saying, which like everything else he said, that I resisted at first, what if it's true? Roger, don't worry about it, it's just an experience. And then it clicked, ah, he's right, it's just an experience. I'm looking for peace of mind, not an experience. In this case, Roger, anger is a biological reaction, not suffering. So what if it's true? What if it's just a biological reaction and not suffering? And then two, <coughs> two weeks later, an event happened and Anger arose for the first time with no judgment around it, no expectation that it wouldn't be there because of the insight that had happened two weeks before. So this anger arose, no judgment, and I laughed at the fact that from my experience, now anger is a biological reaction and not suffering. And <coughs> the fifth, what was the fifth? Oh, free will. We have complete free will in the moment to do it, whatever we think or feel to do. Now, when he said that, um, it made no sense to me because the core of his teaching is, and what I had seen of life prior to listening to his teachings, life is a predetermined story. Life is a happening, a spontaneous arising in the moment, whether you want to look at it as the whole of time or each moment spontaneously arising. So the notion that I'm in control of what happens made no sense to me. So I went to Ramesh with that understanding. And so listening to the majority of his talk was very easy. Life is a predetermined story. You're not the doer. The other isn't the doer. Everything is a happening according to God's will. Fine, no problem with that. And then at some point, he throws it, and at a, any moment, you're, you have complete free will to do whatever you think or feel to do. And so I said, hang on a sec, how can I have free will if life is completely predetermined? I said, I don't have free will. I see that whatever I do is a result of factors that I'm not in control of. And he said, Roger, in each moment you have complete free will to do exactly what you think or feel to do. And I just couldn't reconcile. Everything is predetermined according to God's will and the notion that I have free will in the moment to do exactly what I think or feel to do. And then, once again, it clicked. Ah, what he's saying is that I can't live in a theoretical understanding Theoretical doesn't mean not true or just conceptual. So theoretical can be very true. But in practice, it doesn't feel like I'm um, a slave. It doesn't feel like I'm a puppet at the end of a string. That in each moment, the mechanism by which the predetermined story unfolds 
is by me doing in each moment whatever I think or feel to do. It's just a description. So he was putting forward a description that in practice there is the feeling of free will. That you have the feeling that you can you know, move around, stand up, right, raise your hand, leave. And you can you feel it and you can actually do it. And so that was the, what he's saying, that there is um, a feeling of free will in the moment. And it's a very special inclusion. So what tends to happen is the coin has two sides, and we tend to see only one side. So seeing that life is predetermined is seeing one side, but life is by nature paradoxical. So the paradox is something that the br a paradox is something a brain has trouble reconciling because it seems like a contradiction. But when we see that uh, the seeming contradictions are actually complementaries, so the complementary is it's a single coin. On the one hand, everything is predetermined, and on the other hand, or on the other side, it's what is predetermined unfolds by each individual doing what they think or feel to do in each moment. But the deeper understanding is what the person thinks or feels to do in each moment is not actually their doing, but rather part of the predetermined story of life. So I, when I understood that what I choose is not actually my choice, it's a choice that was destined to happen. So when I recognize that, essentially I wanted to just wrap it all up and say, well, life is completely predetermined. And it is. But can we ignore the fact that even after seeing life is completely predetermined, we still have the feeling that I can lift the phone up. Now, if we don't acknowledge that and understand how that feeling and sense of free will is not out of line with the understanding that life is completely predetermined. If we don't include the feeling of free will, we're not really seeing the coin, we're just seeing one side of the coin. And we, if we want to really understand life, we need to understand it not just as one side of a coin, but as the whole coin. And so in practice, we do have free will, at least the feeling of free will. And that's a gift. And we can't dismiss it and say we have no free will. But let's understand that that free will is, and the decisions that we make are based on our genes and up-to-date conditioning, two factors we've never been in control of, and therefore the choice that feels like my free will is actually the only choice I could have made based on the factors being the way they are. And once I make a choice from that feeling of free will, the outcome isn't in my control. So both in theory and in practice, the free will is worthless, except in the moment where it, I'm very glad it's there. So if someone was to say, I don't have the feeling of free will, I disagree. I'd say what, you, what, what is happening is you have a deep understanding that whatever choices are made in each moment are God's will. But you're missing, you're overlooking the feeling in this moment, which is the feeling that it's your will. And so then when we put these two together, we see, wow, my will and God's will are not two. That's great freedom, right? If it's all God's will and we don't understand that God's will unfolds through my feeling of free will, then we haven't really reconciled the two sides of the coin.